good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Would you pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful to be in your house today. Yeah. Father, we thank you that you love us so much. Jesus, you paid it all for us, Lord, that we would have eternal life with you. Father, we ask your blessing on this service this morning. Satan, we just tell you right now to get out of here. Yeah. We take authority over you in the name and the blood of Jesus. Now go in Jesus' name. You're bound. You have to go. You have no choice. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask your blessing, your outpouring of your spirit, the moving, Lord, of your presence in this place like never before. Bless us. Help us. Draw us into you, Lord, today, even more than ever, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen and amen. Would you stand this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you, God. And we just thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are able, Lord God, to come into your presence and to worship you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we need you, Lord God, more than ever before. And Lord, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that you would touch every heart and every life. Lord, everything, Lord Jesus, Lord, that has kept us from getting closer to you. I just pray, Lord God, that every wall would fall down. And Lord Jesus, we would be able just to worship you and in spirit and in truth. Lord, we love you, God, and we just give you all the praise, Lord Jesus, this morning. Would you just even right now, right now, before we even start singing, would you just surrender everything? Yes. Let everything at the Lord's feet this morning and just, just, Lord, I am here. Lord, what you want, Lord, what you want to happen in me, let it be, let it be, let it be. Thank you, Jesus. Yours will be the friendship. 
friendship and affection I need To feel my father smiling on me The only name that matters to me And yours is the name, the name that saved Mercy and grace, the power that forgave me And your love is all
faithful, God. It's all because you live, Lord Jesus. Lord, it's all because of what you've done on the cross, Lord Jesus. Lord, it's all because of you, Lord Jesus. It begins and it ends with you, oh God. Lord, it's all because of you, Lord Jesus, this morning. And Lord, you are the one that we worship, oh God. Lord, you are the one that we praise, Lord Jesus. Lord, because there is none like you, Lord God. There is none like you, Lord Jesus. And we worship you. We worship you. We surrender our hearts. We surrender our lives, Lord God, into your hands this morning. Lord, everything that we are, Lord Jesus. Everything that we have, Lord Jesus. Lord, because you live. It's because you live. It's because you live, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Don't hold back this morning. It's okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are good.
worship, we praise. Because when we do that, everything in us starts to shift into the direction of where you need to be, where I need to be. Because I don't know about you, but I have things that go on around me in this life and things that have a tendency to distract me. I don't know if that's you or if that's just me, but there are things that are going on all around us. But when we worship God and we worship him in spirit and in truth, there is a transfer, there is a changing, there is a turning that gets us in line of where we need to be, where our eyes need to be focused. And when we recognize him for what he has done, we praise him for what he's done, but we worship Worship him for who he is. Worship goes beyond what he's done for us. Worship goes to who God is. God is God. He's almighty. He's everlasting. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be worshipped. And this morning, as we prepare to to go into God's word, um, I just want us to continue to keep our attitude in worship and, and in prayer because that's where we, we, get, we are in line with what God wants to speak to us and do in our hearts and in our lives. Uh, pray with me one more time as we go into God's word. Dear Holy Father, Lord, I need your help. I need your guidance. I need your strength. I need your leading this morning. Lord God, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross, that I would not be seen, but God, that you would be seen, that you would be recognized, that you would be glorified in everything that is said and done this morning. Lord, we don't want to be the same, Lord, as when we came. Lord, we want to be different, Lord Jesus, because of who you are, your presence, and your transforming power in our hearts, Lord God. Lord, that touches us, that changes us, that helps us, that guides us, Lord God. So, Lord, I pray right now, Lord, we, I, Lord God, I, I, I surrender my, my thoughts, my will into your hands this morning. And I pray that you would bless and, Lord, that you speak to every heart that is here. Lord, that we, Lord Jesus, would be who you've called us to be. Lord, we love you, God, and we thank you. And, Lord, I pray right now for every person that is here. Lord, there are a lot of things that are going on in people's lives. Lord, there are a lot of things that are happening. But, Lord, you are the answer, and, Lord, you are the healer, and, Lord, you are our all in all. And so I pray for each and every one. I pray, I thank you for the healings, Lord, that you've done, and, Lord, I pray that you would heal and continue to heal. Lord, I pray right now, Lord Jesus, Lord, for for, uh, things that are going on, the circumstances that are happening, I pray, Lord God, that you would comfort, that you bring peace, and, Lord, you bring answers in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I pray for, Lord God, just setting free of things, Lord God, Lord, in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, a lot of times we talk about addictions as as looking at drugs and certain things. But, Lord God, there are many things that your people are addicted to that they should not be addicted to, Lord God. Lord, that are, that is keeping them, Lord God, from drawing closer to you. So I pray that you set us all free, Lord God, and Lord, in every area of our lives. Lord, I thank you. I pray for your help. I pray for your, Lord, just your leading and your guiding. Hide me behind your cross. I would not be seen, but you would be seen and glorified, Lord, in everything that is said and done. Lord, we love you, God, and we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen and amen. We have been on a sermon series. We took a break um, uh, for a couple weeks, but we're uh, back in servant, servanthood and servant leading. And all these messages that we've had have had to do with this. And and the reason why we've been going over this is because I really believe as a church that God is calling his people to go beyond just being in the pews. But going beyond that to doing and to going and to serving how Jesus has served. Going beyond being just where we are but doing what God has called us to do. And serving him, serving others and leading the way. This morning, as this will be our, our, our fifth sermon and our last one in, in this topic. But it's based on the life of Daniel, and the, the title is, and it, it is The Excellent Spirit. It build, builds character. Has anyone, you hear dads say this a lot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start right here. You hear dads say this a lot, um, that 
uh, as a kid or their kids go through stuff or they allow their kids to go through stuff. Uh, you, you say it's character building, right? Well, I even mentioned something uh, yesterday during the, uh, the celebration of life. Character building. Things that we go through that develop our character and who we are. Things that happen in this life kind of develop us and kind of refine us in a way. We have choices. We have decisions to make. A lot of times you will hear dads say that, uh, that well, it's, a, it's building their character. Well, we allow this to happen. I even heard a dad one time say that when his kid was eating dirt, that he said, well, it builds character. I'm like, I don't know if that's character building. I think maybe that helped with the immunity a little bit and maybe raising their radon levels a little bit. But I don't think it's necessarily character building. I used to tease my sister a lot. And um, I used to tease her, make fun of her, and do different things. And in my thoughts, I was getting her prepared for the real world. Because I see my sister, and I was like, you know, I, she's not quite prepared for things when she gets out there with other people. And I, I would tell her, I'm just preparing you for the real world. But I think in reality, I was probably uh, <laughs> preparing her or building resentment instead of character building. But there's developing this Christian character, this excellent spirit that is inside of us because of Jesus Christ. And this is what we're talking about. It is, it is what God has done in us that influences, uh, forming our character is about letting the influences of those experiences be in subjection, with, as a Christian, to be in subjection to the word of God. Thus letting God have the final say in who we are and who we are becoming. So when, as Christians, we can talk about character, but not all character that we talk about is godly character. Godly character comes from the word of God. Because people, there's a lot of people, that, well, that, that person, anyone ever heard that? He's a character? That's not necessarily talking about godly character. But there is a difference between the two. But developing Christian character, an excellent spirit, goes beyond outward worldly influences. Forming our character is about letting the influence of those experiences be in subjection to the word of God. So number one this morning, good character. As I'm going to be talking about good character, I'm going to be talking about the excellent spirit and discipline. And I know that we're all excited about discipline this morning because we always like it when, we, when I talk about discipline. Um, but the secret life of Christians, what should it look like? It should look like our lives when we're around everybody else, right? The servant of Jesus, the character of a servant leader should look the same as what happens behind closed doors. How many know that this isn't necessarily always true with believers? How many have seen and got a glimpse of looking inside, seeing behind the doors maybe of somebody, and you looked up to them, you seen them, you respected them, you thought, wow, that is a godly person that has everything together. And then you get a glimpse of something that was behind closed doors and it kind of hits your spirit in a weird way. And you're just, I, I don't know about that. And, and it kind of hits you wrong. And because what you thought wasn't what was really happening in their life, because what was happening, the stuff that was on the inside uh, was not the same as the stuff on the outside. And so when those things are not working together, when we see people, I have been disappointed. I have seen certain ones that I have respected. I thought were godly people. And then behind, when I first became a minister, I remember with some, I got in a group and, and I, I did not realize because I looked up to some of these guys and some of the jokes and some of the things that they started telling. And I was like, wait a second. This is throwing me off a little bit. I, I just got done hearing you, you know, talking about Jesus. I looked up to you, and I was a young, young Christian, and, and it kind of threw, threw me off. And you want to know something? You know what God spoke to my heart? You know what God spoke to my life? In that moment and in that time, he says, you don't look to them. You look to me. You look to me and to my word. You look to me and the example that I am, and you don't look to other people, because when you start to look to other people, you will be disappointed. But that doesn't change the fact that we must align our hearts and our lives with who Jesus is in our lives. 
Romans 5 3, uh, through 5 says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribula tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. So as we're talking about character, our first point this morning, and who we are supposed to be in Jesus Christ. Our first point, what Paul says, tribulations per produce perseverance. Perseverance produces proven character. Character produces hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And the King James Version says and calls it experience. The Greek says it is in the definition here, it is a hopeful endurance, consistency, continuance. So things in this life do affect the people we are. But the Christian disciple of Jesus is different. Many people will say, well, all of my experiences and all the things that have happened, you can say that all those things have contributed to who I am. The experiences and the things that have happened in my life, uh, they all contribute to who I am and how I handle things and what my character is. But there's something that is, when we, for the Christian, that, it, that rises above, that is greater than all the experiences that we have. Why? Because Paul says we can glory in these things because they just, uh, they just provide for us opportunity to gain experience, endurance, and tested character. But when things, when we are faced in this life, the through the word of God, we can be changed and we can become more like him. That shine so bright, brightly is influenced by the hope we have in Christ can only happen because here in verse 2. It says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God in which we stand in faith into the grace of God. Our character development is different. Because of the love of God has been poured out into our lives. Into our hearts. By the Holy Spirit. Who has been given to us. Our character is under, I'll put it simply this morning. Our character is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That is the difference with when, for us to transfer ourselves, our, the way we are in our character and to inline ourselves in who God is, is when we, our spirit, our heart, our life is under the influence of the Holy Spirit and we respond to the Spirit of God. And the things happen in our life produce hope in knowing what our God can do and what he has done. He makes a difference in us. I want to have the character of Christ in my life. But that all stems through Jesus Christ serving him and my heart and my life being subject to the word of God. The word of God, my life, my actions, my thoughts, everything that I am in subjection to the word of God. Now, in Daniel 6, 3, when it was talking about this excellent spirit, we can have a sermon series just on Daniel. But Daniel, that his character and who he was, he was a man that depended, that served the Lord, that loved the Lord, that followed him wholeheartedly, that didn't back down. And when things came his way, he continued. He didn't run the other direction. When the laws changed, he didn't run the other direction. But he continued to worship God wholeheartedly no matter what, even when they changed the law. You know what he, when they told him that he couldn't pray anymore, you know what he did? He prayed three times a day again. When they told him he couldn't do that, he continued to pray as he always did. But I want to mention that he prayed as he always did. It wasn't, he, he didn't just start praying. You know how he kept on praying even after that changed? It's because he was already praying before the law was even changed. He didn't change after the law changed. He continued to do what God had called him to do. He continued to do and to pray to God because he knew that was his strength. A spirit that stands out when you look at everyone around you. And there's something that is different in you that shines brighter than all the other things. 
You stand out. There is something different about you. Everything is above and beyond. You are on top of things. You have things together as Christians. This is not because of who we are, but this is because of who he is. Now I'm going to talk about something that I, that, uh, I don't know if it will step on too many toes, but I think that's okay this morning because I, I have seen, and I will clarify what I'm saying here in just a moment. So listen all the way through. All right. Sometimes we want to we get bits and pieces and then we start thinking about that. And you're like, I don't know about that. Wait until I'm finished. <laughs> get complete context here. But I have seen an uh, extreme exalting of mess, the mess in our lives as Christians. At times, it seems like the common ground between Christian people. Christians have with each other. My life is a mess. They say your life is a mess. We're all a mess. The only difference between us is we have invited Jesus into our mess, but that doesn't always necessarily mean that you invite Jesus to get rid of your mess. And I have seen this. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but I've seen this. I've seen people that, that well, I have, my life is a mess. Uh, your life is a mess. We're just all a mess. I, and I want to clarify here. I'm not saying that life is not messy. I'm not saying that our, our houses have to be perfectly cleaned and everything is perfect. I'm not saying our kids are going to be perfect. I'm not saying that we don't make mistakes. I'm not saying when you come to Jesus that you have everything completely in order because we come just as we are, right? Or that life, that this life we will have everything perfectly in order. Did the disciples have everything in order in their lives when they came to Jesus and when Jesus called them? They didn't, know. But I want to say something this morning. One thing they didn't do was stay right where they were. And that is the difference, I believe, with many people today. And, and I have a hard time saying just people today because it, it's kind of obscure and just kind of thrown out there. But I think we can relate to this because that not only uh, even can happen in our own lives, that sometimes we stay where we are. Sometimes we get stuck where we are. That our character doesn't, doesn't reflect Christ. And sometimes, I want to say that some Christians revert. They do. They start to go back. They start to go backwards. That, then that is a result of when the, the relationship growing cold with Jesus Christ. It is a result of when you say, okay, I, I, I can't go into my word. I can't spend time with Jesus. I can't pray. I can't do this. I can't go to church. I, I, I am, they withdraw. And when you withdraw, you begin to slowly fade away, and you don't even realize it many times. But the disciples were disciples. They were followers of Jesus Christ. They did not stay where they were. And as Christians, we can't afford to stop. We've got to continue to move forward. Now, when I'm talking about mistakes, I'm not uh, talking about living in sin. I'm talking about things where, where we do come short and, and not intentional things that we do. But something the disciples did, they learned and they applied what they learned. They got better. They asked a lot of questions. They didn't let not understanding stop them from listening and doing. Now, this is something I think sometimes uh, we all have a hard time with. But, but the disciples... They were not perfect. They didn't have everything completely together. But what made the difference is that they didn't stay there. They learned. They applied what they learned. And that is a big thing. Learning something and applying what you learn is two completely different things. When you learn something, you know it. You have the knowledge. But until you apply it, that is a completely different understanding of what you have. They got better. They asked questions. And they didn't let not understanding keep them from doing what God called them to do. Sometimes I want to say, I don't understand everything. My wife might think, tell you that I think differently, but I do not understand everything. I don't know all things. But what I do know is that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. What I do know that he saved me from my sins. What I do know that he can change your life. I do know that he can make a difference in you. The things that I do know keep me moving forward and the things that I don't understand and the things that I don't completely grasp doesn't keep me from following Jesus with all my heart. I keep moving forward. I keep moving in him. What made them excellent in all of these situations that brought them to the next level in their faith? They trusted, had faith in the teacher. They received discipline 
and they corrected their ways. What? Discipline? Oh, my goodness. No one tells me what to do, right? I know more. I should be in that spot. I've heard that so many stinking times. It's sickening. <laughs> Discipline. And, well, I, I, I hope, well, never mind. You can't be a disciple without discipline. We have to have discipline in our life. We have to conform to the ways of Christ. And what the word of God says, we must line our lives up with that. And it happens that sometimes we get this wrong. We try to do it from the outside in. And that is not how it works. It happens from the inside out. As we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we allow him to work in us and through us. And we become his disciples and we begin to follow after him. True discipline and true character that happens, happens from inside to the outside and when people start to do it the other way they say I'm tired they say I can't do this I, 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 I am unable to do this but when Jesus is alive and well in your heart and your life and surrendered to him there's something that happens to the outside when we begin to do other things and we're able to do these things the disciples they did they messed up they told little kids not to see Jesus and that's a big deal. We look at it now. No, don't bother Jesus. He's, <laughs> don't bother him. And what did Jesus say? Hey, don't deny the children to come to me. The, the disciples, they messed up. They, they, wanted to, you know, they wanted to call fire from heaven to kill people. They said, Jesus, can we just call fire from heaven and kill all those people? Can we just do that? They wanted to kill people. The disciples wanted to kill people, and they wanted to use God as an instrument to kill people. Would we say that's messing up? We say that's come. Well, they just came up short. Yeah, they wanted to kill people. They doubted Jesus. They rebuked Jesus. Oh my goodness gracious! A disciple rebuked Jesus. He was sorry after doing it, but he rebuked Jesus. They thought Jesus was crazy at times. And when it was them, that was crazy. I want to say that again. When you think other people are crazy, you know something, it might be you. It might be you. What made them excellent? They trusted. They had faith. But you can't be a disciple without discipline. Sometimes our life can seem messy because of the mess that's around us. Anyone ever have taken on because of the mess that's happening around you? You kind of take that as like part of your mess. You, you identify with it. Uh, there's things that happen in, in our families. There's messes that are all around us. It affects us. I'm not saying that other people's mess or sin, that it doesn't affect us. But those are things that necessarily we cannot change. We can pray, but sometimes we, we can't change those things. But what I am talking about this morning is what you can change. And what you can change is the mess that is in your own life. What you can change, you can make a decision that I am no longer going to put up with that. I am no longer going to have that anymore, but I'm going to follow Jesus. I can take the step to change the mess in my own life. And you want to know something? That might help somebody else in their own mess. Instead of saying, my, I have a mess, you have a mess, we all have a mess, let's just have a party. No. Get rid of the mess. What I'm saying, having an ex excellent spirit in Christ in us should be making a difference. The excellence coming forth in our lives. What I'm saying, you, you remember creating me a clean heart in Psalms 51, 10 through 13. 13 says, then I will teach transgressor, uh, transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. But this is all after that. He's like, God, creating me a clean heart. Make, Lord, I'm making things right. I'm getting things put back together. I, I know I can't really help anybody until I, I receive what I, the, the help I need from you to where I can clearly be able to teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Because if I, don't, if, if I am not making things right with you, uh, I, can't, I know that I can't help other people in these areas. Now, I don't want, again, I, I want to clarify here that that doesn't mean that you can't continue going forward it, until you're perfect. I'm not saying until you're perfect. But what I'm saying is you know of a mess that's in your life, take care of it right now now right now and you can it can be gone right now titus 2 7 through 8 says in all things showing yourself to be the pattern of good works and doctrine showing integrity reverence incorruptibility sound speech that cannot be condemned oh my goodness here as he's talking he's saying 
we should have a life, integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, that no one can speak bad or ill about us. That one who is an opponent may be ashamed having no, nothing evil to say about you. Is there something someone could say evil about you? You don't have to say it out loud. I'll let you keep it to yourself. But what I'm saying is clean up the mess in your own life. And you can do that right now. You can do that even before this message is over. Start cleaning things up. Amen. Bible talks about in uh, Matthew 7, 1 through 5, uh, about uh, judge not lest you be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with that measure you use it, will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look at the plank that is in your own, own eye? Hypocrite. Everybody likes to stop right there, right? But it says, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. That verse doesn't say stop trying to help people. That verse doesn't say stop trying to, to do what you're supposed to be doing. It's saying that you need to take care of yourself first. You need to make sure you're right with God. Amen. You need to make sure, sure things are right. Leading with an ex excellent spirit can only happen when we're plank free. When looking at the scriptures, we read looking at the life of Daniel, we see an excellent spirit about him in everything that he did. You get your life in order with God. You do what, what you do well because you do it with integrity, because you do all that you do unto God. You're not doing it unto man. You live, you live in, a, in a different vein. You live in a different vein than everybody else do. You live in the vein of the blood of Jesus. You live in that vein where God is in control. You live in that vein where God's grace and his mercy is working in you and that you are walking in him. You are not in the same vein as everybody else, but you walk in integrity because you do all that you do unto God. My last point this morning, and that is our favorite one, discipline. First, now I went. I said a little bit about it before because I'm warming your. I'm warming my way into it. First Corinthians nine twenty four through twenty seven says, "Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a, per a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown." Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight not with one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Here, Paul talking about being disciplined, and he's talking about disciplining, uh, being disciplined in the body, in ourselves. First Corinthians, I want to remind us about this church. Now, this can sound kind of familiar because the Corinthian church was a spirit-filled church. They were a church that operated in the gifts of the spirit. They didn't do it correctly. That's why Paul had to talk to him about it. But they were a spirit-filled church, operated in the gifts of the spirit. In chapter 1, 6, they had a testimony of the power of Christ working in them. In chapter 6, it says uh, they uh, talked about the works of Christ and that they were a church of ex-sinners. First Corinthian church was a, a again, I'm going to say it again. They are a spirit, a spirit filled church that are filled with ex sinners and the, the ex sinners that they were, because Paul mentioned it, mentions this. They were former fornicators. They were former idolaters, former homosexuals. They were former thieves and people of greed, former drunks, extortioners that had been set free by the power of God. This was a spirit-filled church that had sinners from all, had all these different kinds of sins. Because Paul says that you once were. When he's talking to him, he says you were once these things. But now you're not because you have been set free by the power of God. They were a spirit-filled church. Yet along the way, they stopped growing because their carnality or living according to the ways of the flesh and not the spirit of God. This was a spirit-filled church that wasn't living by the spirit. Oh my goodness. This is, how can that be? But Paul writes to this church, a spirit-filled church that was no longer walking in the spirit of God. Jesus covers all the areas we need to be in God. 
He talks about the whole being. And, and Mark, how are we supposed, we're supposed to worship the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He mentions all four right there. Paul is talking about strength, the part of loving him and serving him. He's talking about the body part, us, right here. The inner strength and outer strength, but they both play a role in the actions of our flesh. But Paul is talking about loving God in our physical bodies. Not only in our minds, not only in our hearts, not only in our spirits, but it transferring from, from where it is here and where it is here to where our actions are different because of the Spirit of God in us. This inner strength, this strength of who we are. Anyone's body ever talked to you before? It talks uh, all the time. It, it, it tells you to do things like don't do that or it will hurt. Uh, when I've I done things before and as I'm getting older, things hurt now more than the, they did before when I used to try certain things. Uh, but my body now tells me when I go to do it, I just don't jump off of things like I used to and do the things I used to because it tell, my body talks to me. It says, don't. Stop. And you know what happens when it tells you in the middle of doing something? That you end up hurting yourself all the more. Or don't do that. That will make you tired. Yes, eat that. That tastes good. Our body talks to us. Just sit here. Your body tells you, I don't want to do anything. Your body ever tell you that? I don't want to do anything. Just sit here. Ever talk to your body? You tell your body, okay, I'm going to get up in 10 minutes. I'm going to get up in 10 minutes because I need to get things done. And you tell your body, okay, I'm giving you 10 minutes, and you're going to have to get in line with me because that's when I'm ready to go, and you better be ready to go. Anybody ever get to the 10 minutes and say, okay, I can go a little bit longer? Your body talks to you. Discipline is conforming your ways to an order. And with a Christian, our, our Christian is... It's falling in line. It's disciplining ourselves to fall into God's order, uh, to his word and who he is. Training, there's a definition. Training expected to produce a specific character or pattern of behavior, especially in training that produces moral or mental improvement. Control obtained by enforcing compliance and order. Uh, controlled behavior resulting from a disciplinary training or self-control. Here, the definition of, of a discipline is getting yourself and conforming to a specific order. But as Christians, when we are disciplined by the Spirit of God, we are falling into an order that belongs to God, an order that comes from His Word, an order that is part of God's kingdom, where which we belong. It is a disciple conforming to the ways of the teacher. It is not desiring to follow, it is uh, not desiring to follow to serve it is not just knowing what you need to do. It's bringing your body, mind, and spirit in subjection to the word of God and his Holy Spirit. It's not just the desire. It's not just the knowing. And I mentioned this earlier. We, all of us, I believe that each and every one of us and many people in this world that you could talk to them and they have a desire. They have a desire to live for God. They have a desire to do godly things. They have a desire, okay? Many people have a desire. But with discipline, it's bringing your body, your spirit, your everything, your mind into subjection to the word of God that it goes beyond just a desire that you have in your heart and becomes action. And that's part of the faith, the action to respond. It's about getting uncomfortable, okay? Discipline is is uncomfortable discipline is uncomfortable it gets easier as you have a process in your life but discipline is uncomfortable stretching those unused mus muscles to be able to run in a way that you will rent win the race now we're, this is the illustration that paul used if you run and you haven't run for a long time are you going to be going very far no, you discipline your body, you condition your body, and when you run sometimes, when you try to go and you're not ready or you didn't prepare yourself and you just have a, have a, a start and you're not even ready to go, you end up hurting yourself a lot of times. But we need to condition ourselves, our, our heart, our spirit, everything needs to be in line to, with our actions that we take in Christ. And it is time to take charge of what our body does. 
Paul says I have a clear focus in verse 26. He says, therefore I run, thus not with uncertainty. Thus I fight not with one who beats the air. Paul puts himself in, the, in this illustration now. He gets himself into motion, but he, he says, I don't run with uncertainty. Paul has a clear focus. And I want to say, and I want to ask you this this morning. Do you have a clear focus in your walk with Christ? Have you endeavored in your heart and in your life that I am going to do this for Christ? I am God. I know you've called me. God, I know you have a plan in my life. Have you, do you have a clear focus in how you're going to reach your neighbors? Do you have a clear focus in how you are going to move and work in your life and live for Christ? Or do you, are you just one that just says, okay, I'll just take it day by day? Paul says, I know why I run. I know where to start, and I know where the race ends. I know for who I run, and he says it is for Jesus. I get my flesh into motion to do the will of the Father. He says, because I know why. Because I know the importance. I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't just, I'm just not spinning around and not knowing what I'm doing in Christ. He says, I know what I'm doing. I've made up my mind. I made a decision. And I'm going to run with all my heart. And I'm also going to condition myself to be able to accomplish with everything that God has called me to do. Not just with a desire, but also in my actions and what I'm going to do because I can see the goal. I know the goal. Part two of this clear focus that Paul had is because he knew Jesus and what Jesus had called him to. Serving is becoming a disciple of Jesus and looking to his example and forming your ways to his ways. Letting the excellent spirit of Christ permeate your whole person. Everything that you are. Everything that you are. Jesus, Lord, I, I ask you this help right now, Lord God. Lord, you, we need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Lord Jesus. We decide, disciplining ourselves in a way that when we run the race to win, to make it across the finish line. And before we pray and end this service, and I'm, I'm getting ready to do that. I know I talked a little bit longer. Patty has not closed everything off yet. That's from yesterday if you missed it. It's okay to laugh in church. It's okay to have a good time. Because this, this is a serious time, but we're all family here too, and we understand what's going on. If your life seems out of order and chaos is ruling the day, your spiritual life is no longer running, your habits look like you and control you, the discipline with your relationship with Christ is gone. You have addictions that run wild in your life. Your focus is scattered. Your vision is lost. Hope is gone. I want to say this morning is your day to get all that back in order. Right now, right in this moment, this is, this is the right time this morning. And you want to know something. In the middle of our mess, Jesus does come and he does help us and he leads us and he takes us out of that. If any of these things apply to you this morning, we're all family here and it's okay. And we, I, I want us to pray for each other. But I'm going to do it a little bit differently. And it could be any of these things. And it could be as simple as saying, I need the discipline of Christ in my heart and my life. To get refocused. To get things back in order. I'm going to ask you to do something because it's a response to the word of God and it's part of getting your body into action. This time I'm not going to call everybody up to the front. But what I'm going to do, and this is, although you're standing in the congregation and you're amongst other people, this is between you and God. But I do want us to pray for one another. If this word has spoken to you and you know you need to get back to where you need to be and moving in Christ like you should. And you need the discipline of Christ and you need the excellence of his spirit in you. Would you take action this morning and just stand where you are? Stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I need your help. 
Lord, my focus is scattered. Lord, my vision isn't where it should be. Lord, I want to make sure I'm where I need to be. And right now, God, I am making that decision. Would you stand this morning? Would you stand this morning? Lord Jesus, God Almighty, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just come to you right now. Lord, we just come to you. You're thinking even in your heart this morning that I don't know if God can take care of that. I don't know if God can help me with that. I've had that so long in my life. Search me, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Lord, we just stand before you, Lord God, this morning as we, Lord, are ending this service. But, Lord, we want to respond to your word this morning. We want to respond to your word this morning, Lord Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. All my days on earth I will away. Jesus. The moment that I see you face to face, God. For nothing in this world can satisfy, oh God. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. All my days on earth I will away. The moment that I see you face to face. Nothing in this world can satisfy. Jesus, Lord, that none of us are the same as when we came. 
Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, when we go out these doors, that there will be a determination in our hearts, oh God. A determination in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Lord, to be the people you call us to be. Lord God, Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, for just a, a deliverance and a setting free right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Every demonic force that is against your people, that is keeping them, that is prohibiting them from getting closer to you, I come against right now in Jesus' name. And we command that to leave them alone in the mighty name of Jesus. The mighty name of Jesus. It has to go. It has to go. It has to go. We are your people and we are free. Lord God, we are your people. And Lord, you set us free, oh God. We love you, Lord. <laughs> we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we just praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.